Good afternoon. Um, today I want to read to you from Romans. It's going to be chapter 6 and part of chapter 7. Um, I have again chose the NLT version today. I know that that's not going to be popular with some of you, but that's quite all right. That's what the Lord has uh, led me to use for today because you know, some of us are on milk and not solid food. And I want to make sure that everyone gets what they need to receive from this message. Um, so again, Romans in the NLT version, chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that grace can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin... How can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. I'm going to stop right there for a minute. So should we keep on sinning so that God can continue to show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And what is grace? Grace is God's unmerited unearned, undeserved favor, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, mercy, generosity, all of it. Should we keep on sinning so that he can just keep pouring out more and more of this unearned, unmerited, undeserved grace? The next verse says, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? I want all of us to just take a moment to reflect right now and ask yourselves this question. Have I died to sin? Do I know that I have died to sin? Is sin losing its grip on me little by little from glory to glory? Am I dying to myself? We have died to sin and we need to walk in that knowledge and we need to walk in that revelation. See, God's grace was just not so we could secure a, a, a spot in heaven. God's grace was not just so that we could avoid hell either. God's grace was actually so that we could be empowered by his Holy Spirit to live a changed, transformed life as a new creation on the earth. On the earth. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. How many of you know that baptism is symbolic, right? Water baptism is symbolic. You're basically being buried with Christ. It's a public declaration that you are burying the old you with Christ. You are crucifying the old you with Christ to that cross and you're being raised when you, when you come up from being submerged, you're being raised to new life, new life. You are now born again, which Jesus told Nicodemus that we must, not we should be, not, you know, we, we, we could be, but we must be born again, not only to enter into the kingdom of God, but to actually see it. When we're born again, the scales actually come off our eyes and we can start to discern spiritual things that made no sense before. When that veil is removed off of our hearts. Are you walking in the knowledge and the revelation that you are a new creation? Are you walking in the knowledge and the revelation that the old you died to sin? Are you walking in the knowledge and the revelation that when Jesus Christ 
conquered death, hell, and the grave by resurrecting after dying on a cross and being buried in a tomb and raising, raising to life three days later, resurrecting three days later, that he put the law of sin and death to an open shame. Okay, that's sin that had so much power of you that you were a slave to before. You are no longer a slave to you too. Are you walking in that knowledge? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, By the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Are you living a new life? As a Christian, are you living a changed, new, transformed life? Are you living in the knowledge and the revelation that the old you died? And you were made alive in Christ Jesus. And you are a new creation born again. And that your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you are living a changed, transformed life that is only possible by the power of the Holy Ghost, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and putting your faith in him. And by putting your faith in him, you not only acknowledge him as your savior, you acknowledge him as Lord of your life. You realize that Jesus Christ is God manifested in flesh, and that he gave his life for yours. He sacrificed his life and took your judgment, your punishment, my judgment, my punishment upon himself. So is this grace just so that we can go to heaven? Is this grace just so that we can avoid eternal judgment? Is this grace just so we can avoid going to hell? When we breathe our last on this earth, no, it's so much more than that. This grace enables and empowers you to live a changed life, a transformed life. And you're living that life in front of the people that remember who you used to be. You're living that changed and transformed life. Walking in the newness of life, the life, the new life that Christ, Jesus Christ gave you in front of people who remember the heathen, the harlot, the addict, the prostitute, the pimp, the dealer, the whatever that you used to be. And how loveless you were and how you are walking in love now and, and speaking from a place of love now. It's undeniable. Have you noticed the changes and the transformation taking place in your life? Are you bearing the fruit of being a new creation? This is what I want you to ask yourself today. Now, if you are new to the faith, if you have just decided to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life and acknowledged him as Savior, realizing that there's nothing you could possibly do to save yourself. We all have a, a certain walk, right? And, and no walk is the same as another person's walk. And as long as you're listening for those convictions and conviction is when you start to feel something is not quite right. Like maybe I shouldn't be doing that. 
Maybe I shouldn't get in this car. Maybe I shouldn't go to this party. Maybe I shouldn't be associating with this friend anymore, whatever it is. We are to heed those convictions of the Holy Spirit because they're there for our benefit. It's, it's like a little alarm that's going off, a warning that this is no good for you. And this isn't who you are anymore. You're a new creation now. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Verse 5, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. So we were united with Jesus Christ in his death and we're going to be raised to new life to our glorified bodies when Jesus returns. Amen. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with cross with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. I want to say that one more time. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. Is sin losing its power in your life? The next verse says, we are no longer slaves to sin. So why are you still bound? If you are walking in the knowledge that you are now a new creation and you have been born again and you are producing fruit of a changed life, why are you still bound? There's a couple reasons for this. Number one, we're not reading our Bibles as much as we should. Okay, coming to Christ is not a one and done. We just say a prayer and we go on about our life. And then when things get hectic and, and I'm, I'm in a tight spot and I'm stuck and I don't know what to do, that's when I call on the Lord. No, this is relationship. This is not religion. Religion is dead. The letter kills, but the spirit brings life and peace. What does that mean? It means that when you're, you're living under the old covenant, the law, and you're trying to buy your own works and your own abilities and your, your, the, the goodness that you believe that you have, you know, some of us believe, well, I'm a good person, so I should be able to go to heaven, right? Wrong. The Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags before the Father, filthy rags before the Father on your best day. No matter how kind and good you think you are. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what that means, the word sin means to miss the mark. We literally went and aimed at a target and we missed it completely. We missed it completely. Not a single one of us could live a sinless, blameless life. So Jesus Christ lived that sinless, blameless life. Why? Because he is God. God, the invisible God made visible and he walked among us on the earth and he lived here for 33 and a half years and three and a half of those years was his ministry on the earth where he performed mighty miracles like never seen before and still people didn't know that their Messiah had come. How sad is that? That people still don't recognize God when he's right there and he's present because we're looking for a certain feeling, a certain manifestation for the power of God to move in a, not just a tangible way, but something we can see. But how many of us know that God doesn't always operate like that? And just because you, you're not getting, you know, this tingling sensation does not mean that God is not present. God is not a feeling. He is a person. He's a person. So that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. When we died with Christ, have you died with Christ? Have you died with Christ? Are you seeing Changes in your life that indicate to you, I am not the same person I was 
two years ago, four years ago, six years ago? Are you seeing the fruit being produced of a changed and transformed life, of a changed and transformed mind, of a changed and transformed, especially if your identity was hijacked before, a changed and transformed identity where you're now walking in the knowledge of who you are in Christ. Not, lead, not needing validation anymore from the things of this world because Jesus Christ is the only validation you will ever need. Have you been crucified with Christ? Are you no longer a slave to sin? Now you might be stuck in certain cycles. But there's a reason why we are stuck in these cycles. One of them is there are strongholds in your life. And strongholds are like fortresses. They're almost like demonic fortresses that have been built to protect what they have established in you over the years. For example, somebody might have a stronghold of fear. And so they are gripped by things like fear and anxiety and they have phobias all over the place and they can't sleep at night. They're restless. They can't shut their mind off. They might have a stronghold of fear. But I need you to understand something. No matter what you're bound by, no matter what kind of demonic bondage or oppression that you're currently battling with, none of it, all the forces of hell are not greater than the shed blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that did for you. You are now walking in authority and you can use his name and walk in that authority and tell demons and devils this is not your house anymore i know i made you comfortable for the last 35 years but i don't want you here anymore i don't i, I i'm not i'm not trying to live in a place of fear god did not give me that spirit did you know that fear is a spirit the bible says i did not give you a spirit of fear but a power love and a sound mind well i don't know about you but i would rather have power love and a sound mind any day than anxiety than depression than ptsd than phobias where you can't even go outside of the house or get in a car and drive i would much rather have a sound mind and that's our inheritance as a child of god he said i didn't give you that spirit so why are you walking around still in slaves when the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was meant to liberate you. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And as a child of God, if you know like you know like you know, you are a child of God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is and the Spirit of the Lord dwells and abides in every single temple, meaning you, Every single child of God dwells in their temple. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty means freedom. So why are you still bound? Maybe you need deliverance. Maybe you're not reading your Bible as much. We are told to meditate on the word of God day and night. Meditate. Read it. Read it slowly. Contemplate what it means. Ask the Lord questions. I don't understand this, Lord. Help me to discern what I'm reading. The Bible is spiritually discerned. But if you have the Holy Spirit, he will help you discern the meaning of what you are reading. And then what you want to do is you don't want to just be a hearer of the word. You want to be a hearer and a doer, meaning now I'm going to take what I read today and I'm going to put it into practice. I'm going to apply it to my life. That's how we are renewed, transformed by the renewing of our mind, the word of God, meditating on the word day and night, 
because the word is sharper than a double-edged sword. Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. The word is sharper than a double-edged sword and shows us the thoughts and intents of our hearts. And so, yes, when we read the word, we get convicted because we realize how sinful we really are. But then we get earnest about not wanting that in our lives anymore. And then we trust, we trust in God to do what he promised. We trust in the Lord to carry out his most perfect will in and through us. We trust that he does not fail. So that takes the pressure off, right? As long as we have a relationship with him and we know that God does not fail. And he who has begun a great work in you is faithful to finish it. He is the author and finisher of your faith. All you have to do is just trust him to do what he came to do, what he said he will, will do, what he promised, because God does not break covenants and he does not break his promises. All his promises prove true. All his promises are yes and amen. So that's another question. Are you reading your Bible? And I'm not just saying, are you just reading it to read? Are you really meditating on it? What does this mean? What does this mean, Lord? How can I apply it in my life? How can I use what I've learned to be transformed from glory to glory? Amen. Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. Again, he broke the power of sin. I'm going to talk about that in a minute and the authority. There may be a lot of you don't even know that you're walking in. And maybe you don't even exercise the authority you've been given. But you don't just have to lay down and take a beating of the enemy of the devil when it comes. Because every single one of us is going to come under attack as a child of God. But we don't have to accept the thought, the, the images that are, are planted in our minds, the thought that comes across our minds. No, we need to walk in, the, in the, the knowledge that we are a new creation. That was the old me. I don't think like that anymore. I wouldn't do that anymore. I'm turning my back on that sin right now. I'm not looking back like Lot's wife. I'm not looking back at Egypt where I once was a slave to the devil and his agenda. I got my eyes fixed on Jesus. I want what he has for me. I don't want anything that my old life had for me. Amen. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. And so do you as a child of God. You are not your own. You were redeemed. That means to be bought back. You were bought at a price. Your ransom was paid in full. You had an enormous debt and Jesus Christ paid it for you, not just in full. He paid everything that you owed up until this point and everything that you would accumulate thereafter. Amen. He paid your debt in full. But not so that we can continue living in wickedness. Not so that we can just keep depending on grace to, to cover up living in iniquity. No, he broke the power of sin over your life. I'll give you an example. This might be too much information, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I have been, I made a conscious decision that I was not going to have relations with anyone of the opposite sex because 
I never knew that my body was a temple and I never treated my body like a temple. Okay. And when I came to the acknowledgement that a lot of the decisions that I made relationally were because there was something very wrong on the inside of me that made allowances for being treated a certain way that made allowances for domestic violence and abuse of the worst possible kind, just for the sake of having someone. So I made a vow to the Lord six years ago. And I said, it's just me and you got, it's me and you until you work out whatever it is in me that would allow myself to be abused to such a degree and think that that's okay or acceptable. I said, it's just me and you. So I made this vow and I, and I kept this vow. Amen. We are no longer slaves to sin. I used to be codependent. I used to be the kind of person that bounced from relationship to relationship because I couldn't stand being alone. I needed to be needed. I was very insecure, but I masked that insecurity with a whole lot of uh, pride and arrogance and haughtiness, but it was all a facade. And then finally, one day, the Lord showed me who I really was. Who I really was, not who I was pretending to be, but who I really was and how I really felt about me. And it hurts. Conviction does not feel good. It's not supposed to feel good. It's supposed to be offensive. That's how we grow. That's how we grow. That's how, that's how we live a, a transformed life. It's when we obey these convictions. When the Holy Spirit, you, you feel that pull in an opposite direction. You want to go one way, but you feel a pull in the opposite direction. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the great restrainer. The great restrainer. I'll give you an example. There was one time where, and I used to be a very combative individual. And I was volatile and angry all the time. And used to curse like a truck driver. And I'll never forget this one time or whatever that I was coming back from church and I ended up in this neighborhood. I didn't know where I was. So I turned on my GPS for a minute to try to figure out where am I so I can find my way back home. And I had some gospel hip hop playing in my car and this woman gave me a look like she wanted me dead. I've never seen her a day in my life where she gave me a look of pure venom and hatred. And I was like, was that for me? And then she came over to my car and she was screaming over the music, telling me to turn it down. And I turned the music down, but she was she was calling me all kinds of nasty names. She was threatening to call the police. She was going to write down my license plate. Now the old me would have flipped. And I felt, I felt that rage. I'm being honest with you here. I felt that rage literally sit in the pit of my throat. And just as soon as I felt it, sit there I felt it drop and just go and I was completely at peace and calm and I said to her you know I'm sorry um I, I figured out where I'm going now I just pulled it up on the GPS so I'm gonna get going you have a blessed day that is how the Holy Spirit restrains us see before when we were children of wrath we were controlled by the devil we were controlled by Satan. We were controlled by demonic bondage. But now that the Holy Spirit lives in us, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that is who restrains us. That is who we are controlled by. And just for the record, I just want to make sure that everyone understands the Holy Spirit is not the power of God. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he is grieved all the time when we ignore his convictions. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. 
the old you died so that you could live for Christ. I don't know if you know what that means, but the old you died so you could live for Christ. So again, you were redeemed. You were bought back. You are not your own. The old you died so you could live for Christ. The spirit of God who now dwells in you enables you to do good works. I need to be clear that good works does not equate salvation. There is no good works that you can do to save yourself. However, the Holy Spirit equips you and enables you to do good works to live for Christ. See, now you're going to be part of the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is what? Number one, that's why we need to be in our Bible. That's why we need to read our Bible. We need to study to show ourselves approved. We need to meditate on the scripture day and night. Why? Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to preach the gospel to a single soul because you don't understand what it means yourself. So we study to show ourselves approved. And we don't forsake the assembly. We go to church. Why do we go to church? Just so we can check it off our to-do list? No. Why do we go to church? Because the Bible says don't forsake the assembly. Well, that's only part of the reason. Another reason why you go to church is because fellowship is important. You need to be with like-minded individuals. We're all part of the same body and Christ is the head. We're all members of that body. And we're there to edify and to empower and to encourage and to uplift each other. And even gently correct and rebuke each other in love when needed. We also go to church so that we can develop the heart of a servant because how many of us know that Christ did not come to the earth to be served, but he came to serve. He was again giving us an example to follow. That's what we're here to do. We're here to serve the Lord and his purposes on the earth and his people. Amen. So this is just... Not so you can get a ticket into heaven. This is not just so you can avoid the eternal torment of hell. It's so much more than that. You are not your own. Verse 12. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Now, the temptations are going to come. There's nothing you can do about that. Temptation is always going to, to come. But God is not the one who does the tempting. The devil is. Don't let sin control the way that you live. Here's a good example. If the Bible tells us to flee sexual immorality, and we meet a man or a woman that we're interested in, right? But they're per pushing us for sex before we're actually married. What does the Bible tell us to do? Flee sexual immorality, not enter into fornication and then get married later. No, there's a divine order and a way of doing things. And God expects us to follow it. Especially when you know better, you're supposed to do better. Do not let sin control the way you live. Now... If you're trying to fight and overcome temptation without the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to lose every time. It's not possible. Okay. The, again, the Holy Spirit is the great restrainer. Okay. That, that's how you overcome. That's how you overcome temptation. It's when you, when you realize that apart from the Lord, apart from Jesus Christ, you can't overcome temptation you can't overcome sin okay he says apart from me you you can't do anything he said apart from me you can't bear any fruit at all so do not give in to sinful desires well what are we told to do look the other way Take out of sight, out of mind. Look the other way. Avert your gaze. Look at something else. Go somewhere else. Don't keep going back to the place where you're being tempted. Throw that away if it's a problem. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. 
Again, your body is your temple of the Holy Spirit, a temple of the Holy Spirit. So you need to understand something, right? The Lord says, I never leave or forsake you. Many of us don't think about this, but I want to give you this thought. I think it's important. If you're a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, do you think the Holy Spirit wants to go smoke with you? Do you think that the Holy Spirit wants to go to the club and have a few drinks? Do you think that the Holy Spirit wants to observe you laying down with somebody outside of a covenant marriage and having to watch that? The Holy Spirit is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He can't stand the sight of sin. There is no iniquity in him. He's holy. There's no sin in him. Do you really think that the Holy Spirit wants to join you in your folly, your foolishness, and your sin? I can tell you right now, he does not. And it grieves him. Again, the Holy Spirit is a person. And it grieves him. When we bring him with us into these activities. And he has to bear witness to these choices that we make. Knowing that it's wrong. Don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. What's another way that... We, we could do that. Entertaining a thought. Entertaining a thought. Because the thought itself is sin. Jesus made this clear. It's not just the, the act of adultery itself. It's the lusting after another person. Lusting after another person means you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. And if God tells us, in his word that if, you're, if you're, your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's not saying that literally, but he's saying that's how serious you need to take sin. That's how serious you need to deal with sin. He says the same. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. That's to emphasize that it's not to be taken lightly. So what do you do? What do you do when a thought comes into your mind or a perverse image? Because the devil does that all the time to Christians. Spirit-filled Christians. He'll try to implant a, a thought or an image in your mind. If you entertain it, then it becomes sin. But what are we told to do? If you read your word, you would know that we're supposed to cast down every imagination Every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into subjection unto the obedience of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to bring that thought into subjection? First of all, we need to take authority over that thought. The minute that it comes into your mind, uh-uh. Or it, it could be a thought as far as words, not just an image. Let's say it's a thought of condemnation. Maybe you have a thought that says you're going to hell because you did something that you weren't supposed to do. But you need to attack that thought with the knowledge of God. What does the knowledge of God say? It says there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It says that I am saved by grace through faith and no works of my own. So there's nothing that I could do To save myself. And when, when you use the word. Against the devil's deceptions. And against his attacks. He has no choice but to flee in Jesus name. At the name of Jesus demons flee. That's the truth every time. Now I'm here to tell you that they can be persistent. They can be persistent. They're not always going to leave on the first try. This is why we need to know the word. So when my mind is being assaulted by whatever, I just say, uh-uh. I cast that thought right back to the pit of hell where it came from. I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind and heart right now. I don't accept that thought. I have the mind of Christ. 
I said, may the thoughts and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God. And then I will tell him because he says what we bind on the earth is bound in the heavenlies and what we loose on the earth is loosed in the heavenlies. The word loose means to allow. So I say I loose purity, holiness and righteousness over my thoughts, over my dreams, over my mind, over my heart right now in Jesus name. And that's how you fight. You don't just entertain the thought or the urge. You fight it with what? The word. Why do we fight it with the word? Because we're told that we're told to put our armor on in Ephesians, right? We're told that there is an armor of God that we need to be, we need to be suited up daily, right? We need to put this armor on daily to protect us from the attacks of the enemy. And the only piece of that armor that isn't for a defense, but is actually to launch an attack of your own is the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Do you know your word? Do you know the word? Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have an intimate and personal relationship with him or do you just call on him when you need something? Do you have an intimate and personal relationship with him where you talk to God every day because Jesus said, cast your cares on me, lay your burdens down? That means that we're actually supposed to talk to God and tell him how we're feeling. And, you know, when the weight of the world is on our shoulders or we're frustrated or things aren't really working out and we need guidance and we need direction, the Holy Spirit is actually there to counsel you. The Lord is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Literally, the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. He wants to give you direction. He wants to give you counsel. But those who ask receive, not those who stay silent, not those who only come to God when you need something. No, this is relationship. And how many of us know in order to maintain any kind of a relationship, there has to be communication, regular communication. You wouldn't come home to your husband or your wife and never speak to them or only speak to them when you need something. No, see, we put so much more um, effort into worldly relationships than we do with the one who created us and breathed breath into us and knows us better than we know ourselves and watched over us while we were being formed in our mother's womb, whose thoughts of us outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. We ignore that God. We deny ourselves a relationship with that God. When he actually created a way through Jesus Christ for you to enter into the throne room and talk to him anytime, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And he's actually looking forward to hearing from you. And what's funny is that he already knows what's on your heart, what's on your mind. He just wants you to come to him. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. God doesn't want a piece of you. He doesn't want your leftovers, your scraps of attention. He wants all of you. The greatest command in the Bible is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That means he needs to be number one in your life. Everything else comes after him. Amen. Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Remember that even our bodies, even our temples can be used for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. I want somebody to catch that revelation today. Sin is no longer your master. 
The power of sin and death has been broken over your life. You are a new creation. Sin no longer has the final say in your life. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Again, reminding ourselves that we are to be born again. That God's grace is not so sin can abound. God's grace is so that you can live a changed life. A transformed life. And so that he can use that, that changed, transformed life. Because we overcome, not just by the blood of the lamb, but also by the word of our testimony. And the word of our testimony is what Jesus Christ did for you. And you're going to go out and you're going to tell other people, God did it for me and he'll do it for you too. This is what Jesus did in my life. This is who I used to be. These are the kind of things that I used to do. That's your testimony right there. And when people see, not only that you can just relate, but that you've been through things that they might even be walking through right now, it gives them hope. How many of us know that Jesus Christ is our blessed hope? And Jesus offers us hope. How? Through our testimony of what he did for us what he is done he's doing in and through us and what he did in our lives amen and he gets all the glory god gets all the glory so you're now living under the freedom of god's grace not so sin can abound jesus didn't come to abolish the law he came to uphold it but he also didn't come to condemn anyone. He came to save them. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? Now, I know there's going to be several people that don't even like the word slave. I get it. But this is the easiest way for us to understand as as a child of wrath, you were a slave to the devil and you were a slave to his agenda. And now you are a slave or you are an obedient servant. When you obey the Lord. When you follow his commands. Amen. So it says, don't you realize you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And the number one command can be summed up in one thing, and that's love. Love for God. First and foremost, you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you, then you love your neighbor as yourself. That's, su that's the sum total. Because when you, when you look at it, if I'm loving my neighbor, I won't lie to my neighbor. If I'm loving my neighbor, I won't, I won't cheat them out of something that's rightfully theirs. If I'm loving my neighbor, I won't be deceptive and conniving. And if I'm loving my neighbor, I'm not going to offer them false flattery, but I'm going to be truthful and honest. If I'm loving my neighbor, I'm going to show them mercy. If I'm loving my neighbor, I'm going to give of myself when I have it to give. I'm going to be generous and helpful and kind and compassionate if I'm loving my neighbor. But how many of us remember that before Jesus Christ got a hold of us, we were far from loving our neighbor. We didn't even love ourselves. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. And I say that one more time. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. And I do need to emphasize that that death is eternal. It is eternal destruction. It is eternal torment, meaning death is not the end. You don't just get buried in the ground and that's the end of it. No, your soul is eternal. 
And if you choose to reject Jesus Christ on the earth, he said he's going to reject you before his father, before his father in heaven, before the father in heaven. And that would be your choice because hell was created for the devil and his angels. So it is a choice. He gives us the free will to be able to choose the free gift of salvation. It's up to you. So you can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God. There's no happy medium. There's no in between, which leads to righteous living. I'm going to say that one more time. When you choose to obey God, when you choose to heed the convictions of the, the, the Holy Spirit, when you obey the convictions of the Holy Spirit, when you listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, when you choose to obey God, it leads to righteous living. When you get in God's word and you put into practice in your own life and in your relationships, what you learned when you meditated on that scripture day and night, you are choosing to obey God and that leads to what? Righteous living. Thank God once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Do we obey just because it's, it says in the Bible that we need to do this, that, and the third? No, we obey. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. But there are so many people that, you know, they, they claim to love the Lord. They claim to love God. They claim to love Jesus. But are you loving him with the way that you're living your life? Are you loving him with your actions? Are you loving him with the way that you treat people? Are you just honoring him with your mouth? Or do you honor him with your deeds on a daily basis? Do you honor him with your life? with your example on the earth? That's a question we all need to ask ourselves, me included. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. Now I know again, slave is not a popular term, but I'm going to tell you right now that I would rather be a slave to righteous living any day than be a slave to the devil and his agenda, than be a slave to lawlessness, than be a slave to depression, than be a slave to anxiety, than be a slave to adulterous relationships, than be a slave to all kinds of addictions and compulsions and destructive habits. I would rather be a slave to righteous living any day than be a slave to mental torment. Than be a slave to things like pride and arrogance that would keep me from reaching for the one who can heal me and liberate me from my bondage, from my torment, from my pain. Yes, I would rather be a slave any day to righteous living than a slave to the alternative. Because of the weakness of your human nature, right? Because we're, we're told our flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. My flesh might, may fail, but the Lord is my portion forever. Right? So we know that our, our flesh is weak and it's always going to be weak. But if you spend too much time focusing on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, if you haven't come out from among them, if you're still sitting on the fence, kind of in this lukewarm stance, I love God, but I don't want to let go of these things. I love God, but I like my old friends. I, I love God, but I really like the club and and. and I don't know. It's kind of boring as a Christian because I have to be set apart and I have to let go of certain friendships. And I've known these people for a long time. Well, how many of us know that there's a waging war that starts happening immediately between the flesh and the spirit? The flesh rejects, is repelled and vehemently 
bucks up against the things of God. Your flesh does not want to pray. Your flesh does not want to worship the Lord. Your flesh does not want to go to church. Your flesh does not want to develop the heart of a servant. Your flesh does not want to study to show yourself approved. Your flesh doesn't want to read your Bible. And this is why we need to die daily. This is why our flesh needs to be crucified. Our flesh needs to be crucified. The flesh is weak. Don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are what? Free. Again, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. What are you free from? Your slavery to sin. And you have become slaves to righteous living. Hallelujah. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. How many of us know that the more you ignore the convictions of the Holy Spirit, the easier it is to get deeper and deeper into that sin, to get more and more ensnared into iniquity. Why? Because when you quench the Spirit, when you quench the leading of the Holy Spirit, when you quench the conviction of the Holy Spirit, your heart becomes hardened again to the things of God and your sin separates you from him, which makes it much easier for you to sin and not so not feel so bad about it. You might you might get convicted, but not enough to make a change. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. That word become indicates that you're not holy right away. Yes, we went from sinner to saint. That part is true. But you're not holy right away. You're in the process of being made holy. And that process will be finalized. But not until you get your glorified body when Jesus returns. And none of us know the day of the hour. So we are to be watchful and sober-minded. I want to emphasize that again. Sober-minded. Watchful. Ready. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. How many of us know that when we were slaves to sin, first of all, we didn't feel bad about it because everybody else was doing it. It was normal. It was familiar. And even people that when they try to tell you that you're doing something wrong, because it's so common, it doesn't feel bad to you. It doesn't feel bad to you at all. Your flesh loves to sin. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. That is a really good indication of the fruit of a transformed life. That is a really good indication of when conviction hits. And conviction will never feel good again, but it's necessary. Is when you become ashamed of the things that you were once comfortable in, that you once made allowances for, that you once didn't see a problem with. That's a good indication that the Holy Spirit is doing an inner work in you.
ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom, but now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Again, our obedience isn't because of an obligation. Our obedience is because we love Jesus. We truly love Jesus. We want to please him. We want for him to be pleased with us. We want the thoughts of our heart the thoughts and meditations of our heart to be pleasing in his sight. We want to, to serve him. We don't want to hurt him. We don't want to grieve him. He's done too much for us. Now you do these things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, I'm going to finish with this chapter seven, verse four. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. But if you're still trying to live under that law, you remain accursed. I need you to understand that that's the difference between religion and relationship. When you're trying to follow a bunch of rules and reg regulations because the Bible says that I need to do this and I need to do that. And it, it becomes more about uh, tradition and trying to, by your own works, gain some type of favor with the Lord. But how many of us know that, again, your righteousness is filthy rags before the Father? However, when we made Jesus Christ Lord and savior his righteousness becomes our own his righteousness is imputed to us so now when the father looks down at you he sees the sinless spotless blameless no defect lamb of god amen that's what he sees but when you're trying to, in your own works, gain more approval from God, that in itself is, is, is prideful. To think that we could possibly do something to earn a greater position in the eyes of the Father than the finished, complete, and most perfect work of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection on, on the cross, we need to, we need to humble ourselves and quickly. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. So how many of us know that God's spirit becomes one with our spirit? The two become one. We're now in a covenant. Amen. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds. For God, again, those good deeds do not earn your salvation. They do not, um, they do not gain you a place in heaven. No, the, the harvest of good deeds that we're now able to do is because of the Holy Spirit who now lives and dwells in us. Verse 5, when we were controlled by our old nature... Sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No longer captive and a slave, liberated, finally free new in Christ, made alive in Christ, living for Christ. Now we can serve God. Not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. We need to be spirit led. 
We need to be spirit led. We need to see the fruits of the spirit in our life, which are what? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Will you have all of these to a greater degree? No, some you will have more than others. But the whole point is that you want to see more evidence of the fruits of those spirit of, of the spirit in your life day to day. You want to see progress being made where you're becoming more gentle and you're becoming more loving and you're becoming more patient. This is evidence that you're, you're being spirit led. And you also have to let him lead you, which means that you're denying what your flesh wants, right? Because your flesh wants to go left and the spirit is saying, go right. And, and to go left makes more sense. But if the spirit says, go right, you need to follow the leadings of the spirit. Why? Because the spirit of God knows better than you where you should go and what you should be doing. Who you should be joining yourself to and who you should be staying away from. What doors to open and what doors not to go anywhere near. Let him lead you. Even if it doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm in that season right now where I'm just letting the spirit lead me. And you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. He's the beginning and the end. The alpha and the omega. God is outside of time. So he's already in the future working out what's going to happen so that when you get there, everything will be already laid out. The foundation will be laid out. Everything will be prepared for you to step into what he has for you in the future. He's already there. Amen. So just... um let God lead you. Pay attention to those convictions from the Holy Spirit. They're not to, you know, they're not to um, you make you a prisoner so that you, you, you have no life and you can't do anything. They're, they're all for your benefit. Every conviction is for your benefit. It's for your good. Okay, his plans are to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Again, I, I hope that this, this word um, did whatever it needed to do today. I, I hope that, you know, there was conviction where there needed to be conviction. I hope that, you know, a fire was ignited that possibly died out a long time ago. I, I hope that this, this gave you... Uh, and knowledge of the authority that you truly walk in and and hopefully it will give you the confidence to start putting that that authority into practice so you can stop being the devil's punching bag so to speak and you can stand up to him and you can say uh uh devil in the name of Jesus you're under my feet amen <laughs>